Hello, everyone. I'm Céline Ober, the Communication Coordinator of the Ontology COP, and I will facilitate the webinar today. We'll learn about GOMO, the Governance Operational Model for Ontology, developed by BISF and its partner. This webinar is organized by the Ontology Community of Practice of the CGIR Platform for Big Data and Agriculture. Now, let me introduce you to Alexander Garcia. Alexander is an expert in semantic and knowledge technology with more than 10 years experience in the biomedical and chemical domains. He leads the ontologies and knowledge team at BISF that facilitate the adoption of knowledge technologies and paradigms across the organization. The team actively participates in the development of ontologies, linked data solutions, governance model, and semantic frameworks that are related to the business value of data, as well as to the needs of the end user. So over to you, Alexander. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much, Celine, and thank you very much, Elizabeth, for this invitation. I really appreciate it. Uh, it, it comes close to my heart because I, I did work at the CGIR, as I told you uh, early on during our, um, um, during our first conversations. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this um, webinar. Um, in this webinar, we will be talking about, we will be presenting a little bit uh, on the work that we are doing that has to do with ontologies and, uh, and, and knowledge graphs. So as Celine said before, uh, we will go through a series of webinars. Uh, this is pretty much uh, about the collaboration that we have with the University of Stanford. So the second one, the one after this, is going to be um, with Matthew and Mark uh, Musen. Um, on the um, backend database that we are working with them for um, for WebProtege. And the third one is going to be a joint, uh, a joint uh, webinar between, I think that between Matthew, I hope between Matthew and me um, with respect to uh, knowledge graphs and, and ontologies. <clears throat> so um, without um, any anything else to say about that, let me just say that this is uh, this GOMO. GOMO stands for Governance Operational Model for Ontologies. And, and, and GOMO started to be uh, like a, um, a brainchild of mine, but uh, at the end now, right now, I can I can only say that this is really a team effort, and, and I just want to say this uh, uh, clear: uh, this is the work of of, of the team uh, that has that is currently working in ontologies uh, here at BSF, and now we have uh, much more involvement from other communities of practice within BSF. And that, that is very encouraging because it's, it's a clear indicator of uh, the success of this project. So <clears throat> why, do we need, um, why do we need governance? Um, and why, why do we need GOMO in particular? Because we need to ease the path for terminological resources. We need to ease the path for the adoption of terminological resources. Easing the path for uh, the adoption of terminological resources uh, goes through having standards, having quality methods. Of course, tools is also a part of that. Um, knowing what kind of support do we need to provide to our uh, communities, uh, having uh, ways to empower the communities because ontologies are at the end of the day responding to a business need and behind any business need in organizations like BSF, you always have communities of practice. Um, GOMO is also about building the community, building uh, the capacity uh, across uh, all of the organization. So <clears throat> Why, um, why ontology governance? Uh, I wanna say here, I wanna start um, this slide by saying that this is about governance and not government. Uh, and this is about policy and not about politics. And uh, this, this is a subtle distinction, uh, but it's, it, it must be made and, and you will understand why. I hope that uh, by the end of this presentation, it, it comes clear why I'm making this distinction. Um, why do we need governance? Well, because we need we need a, basically a framework for managing the different components and stakeholders uh, that participate in the ontology development process. Um, when I started to conceptualize this whole project, I, I was thinking in terms of the ontology development process as such. But now, as we have been going through the process of, of doing uh, go the governance uh, in, for, for our organization, I think that I have come to the conclusion that we are really making uh, this uh, governance framework, not for the ontology development process, but for the business of ontologies, which is a little bit higher up. Um, <clears throat> we need to facilitate um, the engagement of many different communities of practice with uh, very, very different interests. We need to facilitate uh, the engagement of people who come to the uh, business of ontologies with a diverse set of skills a very diverse of skills with uh, uh, knowing some of them have been very advanced in their uh, knowledge about ontologies or terminological resources in general, and some others just uh, 
acknowledging the need to have uh, standardized vocabularies in their applications and thereby uh, understanding that they need to go about um, doing their terminology related uh, process for their specific needs. So we need to level that play playground in terms of skills. Um, but we also need to make sure that we have um, uh, common workflows in, in support of the overall business of ontologies, not, not just the ontology development process, but, but here it's more about the whole business of ontologies. Of course, last but not least, we also need to understand um, how our tools are playing a role throughout the process. So um, it, it, it's interesting here, when we we're putting together this slide, we put together tools at the end. Uh, and, and, and this is a clear indicator that tools are something that we are considering, yes, very important, but we are not moving from um, saying we need this tool, but instead we are moving from, the, from, from saying uh, we have this diverse uh, set of needs, requirements um, that, um, that, that are addressing a specific business needs uh, that have to uh, allow us to um, do business value and that uh, for which we need governance. <clears throat> so that's that's pretty much the rationale behind our GOMO project, the governance operational model for ontologies. What is GOMO delivering? Well, GOMO is delivering uh, um, quite a few things, uh, things like, for example, uh, training sessions, recipes uh, in the form of how to's, how to do things, metadata conventions, uh, rules for permanent URLs, operational workflows, etc. That's what comes out of GOMO, and that comes out of GOMO by way of um, some very specific work streams. So we're working, all of GOMO was conceptualized upon five work streams. Governance, the standards, outreach, training, and best practices and methodologies. All of these are orchestrated um, so that they make real the most abstract one. Governance is very abstract. It's very difficult to explain. Um, and governance always needs to be implemented, to be made real by way of the standards, outreach training, and methodologies and best practices. So the standards, well, I mean, that's an easy one. Like for instance, uh, all, all, all ontologies might com must comply with the RDF um, W3 uh, standard. Um, that's an easy one. Uh, methodologies and best practices, it's also an easy one. Training is also an easy one. Outreach is also an easy one. But how you orchestrate this for in support of the governance principle. That's not so easy. And that's, that's I think that that's at the core of GOM. <clears throat> Where are we heading? I mean, we are doing this because of a reason. We are doing this because at the end of the day, uh, we have seen that we need to have modular ontologies, that we need to have interoperable ontologies. I mean, interoperable, not just internally, but also with, with external partners, uh, that we need to be able to do reason on ontologies if the business needs uh, clearly states that out. Uh, that we also need to empower the communities of practice because, because the communities of practice within BSF are at ultimately the ones that will be um, maintaining the ontologies, um, either directly or indirectly. Um, what do we, um, we want to get at the end? At the end, we want to have like a network of ontologies. Uh, we want to be able to say that a distillation column participate in a catalytic distillation and that it enables an ester condensation pro, uh, reaction and that in this ester condensation reaction, uh, acid plus alcohol participate as regions. That's, that's, that's pretty much uh, the, the, the vision. That's the kind of um, knowledge graph that we want to have for our terminological resources. <clears throat> why, why do we need governance principles? I mean, um, governance, as I said before, is probably the most as abstract one, and, 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 and governance is difficult to explain. Um, but, but it's critical because governance is what justifies the existence of standards, uh, outreach, training, and methodologies and best practices. Governance provide a context for all the others. All the others work implementing governance, implementing principles, but, but uh, the principles are kind of the anchor for all of the, all, all of the others. Um, what are principles? Principles are fundamental rules that guide and influence how ontologies are developed and used in the organization. And how can principles help us? Well, they help us by giving a general context for the ontology development and usage. Up to this point, I'm pretty sure that those of you who are familiar with OVO uh, are, are starting to, to, to see some commonalities. And this is, this is clearly because this, uh, this specific GOMO when project, when I was conceptualizing it, I was very influenced by, by OVO, but I was also very influenced by a much more pragmatic approach, which comes from schema.org. 
and, and, and the experience in bioschemas. So all of these three um, came together in my mind in, 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 in the conceptualization of GOMO. And I, and I can see that uh, in the actual implementation of GOMO, um, things that from, from those three streams have come together very nicely. Um, how do governance principles interact with other work streams? As I said before, um, you, you have the principles, you have the standards, outreach, et cetera, but they, don't, they are not isolated work streams. They are very interrelated. They support each other. They talk to each other. So let's consider an easy one. Let's consider a principle that states that all ontologies must be fair. That on its own doesn't tell anyone much about uh, how to go about uh, doing fair ontologies. But if we say that, um, that uh, ontologies must be fair by way of um, for having um, the stable IRIs um, by way of uh, having best practices that uh, indicate how to publish an ontology with a stable IRIs by having training sessions geared towards how to manage IRIs in ontologies. And also by making sure that you have a clear outreach um, strategy that you've implemented that outreach strategy so that uh, you can um, understand how the issue of IRIs and, and permanent URLs, et cetera, is being dealt with by other communities. Then, then you're talking business, then you're really um, walking the walk. You're making that uh, fair uh, principle something much more concrete, something much more measurable. And, and measurable is key here. Um, <clears throat> what are the uh, governance principles that we have so far been working on? So uh, in a nutshell, we have now um, eight uh, principles, um, principles on availability, um, stating that ontologies must be available. Um, across the organization, but availability doesn't mean that they are open for everybody because we have access rights and we also have security policies. So uh, we also have a principles that states that uh, ontologies must come up with their own access rights and security policy, policies. Of course, that, that puts a burden on the tooling because the tools have to um, make sure that you can manage access rights and security policies uh, when, when, when making ontologies available. Uh, we also have principles on persistency, persistency uh, meaning how you go about deprecating terms, how you go about doing version control. Uh, we also have a principle on documentation, uh, fairness. I will go deep into this one a little bit later on this presentation. Modularity uh, and ontologies must be, as I said before, um, driven by a community and thereby uh, responding to a business need. Um, ontologies uh, have to be fair. Yes, ontologies have to be fair, but how do we go about having fair ontologies? And then we have um, we have um, discussed and, and, and put together a set of recommendations. And those recommendations are of course related to standards, related to uh, training sessions, related to best practices. So that uh, in this case, for instance, um, fairness is related to recommendations on IRIs and metadata formats, uh, reuse of ontologies, naming conventions and licensing. <clears throat> uh, the principles, uh, um, how are the principles um, and the ontology development process coming together? So <laughs> from, from our experiences, we have seen that, I mean, this, this, um, this um, development process is, is, is very well known by all of you in different forms. Uh, you always have the requirements and kickoff uh, stage, you always have an implementation stage, you always have a publication and a maintenance or a curation stage. Um, throughout all of these, uh, what you have is that uh, principles on fairness, uh, they apply uh, equally on all of these four stages. Uh, the same is true for principles on community. Uh, the principles on modularity are, from what we have seen, uh, much, more, uh, much more important uh, when you're doing implementation, when you're doing knowledge licitation, when you're doing this iterative ontology building process, um, <clears throat> when you are wondering um, how are you going to break down the complexity of any given topic in, 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 in several different uh, vocabularies? How you go about modularizing that? Um, once, you have, um, when you ha once you have achieved a certain mat maturity point, then you deploy the ontology. And that, that's the point in which you publish your ontology. And then you're making it available. You are having access rights. You have to have documentation. Documentation is not just meant uh, for ontology developers. Documentation is also... Um, uh, meant for people consuming the ontology, meaning software developers as to how to consume the, the ontology or APIs or, um, or endpoints of any kind. And of course, once you publish the ontology, you're throwing that ontology to the, to the, to the community. And, and by doing that, you have to consider the curation workflow. And for that, 
um, curation workflow principle on persistency applies together with everything that comes with persistency, standards, um, related um, best practices, related um, um, trainings, etc. cetera. Um, throughout all of these, we have <clears throat> brainstorming sessions. We also have uh, some specific events, like for instance, boat camps uh, and notathons, uh, bring your own data kind of events. Uh, and we also use um, tools like for instance, Web Protege. For the publication stage, we, we use tools uh, you are all familiar with, like for instance, the ontology lookup service from, um, from the EBI. And also um, tools like, for instance, Bioportal and some other tools that we have built internally uh, to do the publication of the ontology, APIs, etc. Um, maintaining the ontology is not just an issue that has to do with Git. It, al it is also an issue that has to do with uh, curation tool that we have uh, built. This is an, an in-house development. Um, why do we need a standard? So standards is a key component in our in our conceptualization for governance because the standards are related to quality. So you, you comply with the standards and you can have a pretty uh, good understanding of how of the quality of your ontology. The standards also make it possible for ontologies to be interoperable. The standards also make it possible for you to reuse ontologies and to enable a standardized um, tool to facilitate the standardization of the workflows by means of which you go about developing ontologies. Um, what is a standard? The standard is basically an agreed on convention on how to build and maintain ontologies. And the standards um, make it possible for you to apply quality assurance methods. How in compliance are you with X, Y, or Z standard? And also they inform the best practices. They help us in standardizing the actual um, how tos workflows for building, maintaining, or deploying ontologies or onboarding ontologies, if that is the case. Um, let's consider the standards in action. I mean, again, let's go back to this principle, fair uh, ontologies must be fair. So uh, the standards uh, states uh, what is the RII structure and by way of the standard, we also have the quality assurance, the corresponding quality assurance method. So whoever wants to test that uh, only has to uh, just uh, run the corresponding workflow. Um, we, up to this point, we have a set of 12 standards. Those 12 standards address issues on, on, on convention and serialization, uh, mandatory and additional metadata for ontologies as a whole, as well as for uh, classes and properties in the ontology, uh, deprecating um, an, an obsolescence of ontologies uh, of uh, old entities, uh, permanent URIs, um, version control, the standards for uh, version control, um, for instance, the, uh, rep the structure of the ontology uh, repository in the kit, uh, transformation across formats. Uh, we are not just dealing with RDF, uh, we are also dealing with OVO, for instance. Um, so, so we have the standards for that. And, and also, and, and this is important here to understand that we are dealing with terminological resources and not just uh, ontologies in the, in the most strict sense of the word. Um, so, so we have to consider a lot of transformations across formats. And we also have the standards that have to do with uh, diagram notation. Uh, for uh, the documentation of the ontology. Um, <clears throat> how, how does it translate into something more tangible? I mean, how do standards and quality uh, methods translate into something much more, um, much more digestible? So let's consider, for instance, that at any given time uh, in, in the, during the process of ontology development, we may have the need to uh, assess the quality of an ontology. And for that, we have uh, quality assurance pipelines, automated quality assurance pipelines, so that you run the ontology through this quality assurance, it passes and it fails some of the tests, but at the end, you will always have a report in, in, the, in a dashboard, in a quality assurance dashboard, so that you know what, what um, um, how, in, how in compliance with uh, which um, quality uh, criteria was your ontology and, and where it was not in compliance with, uh, with, with any given uh, quality uh, criteria. In this case, the ontology may have passed the RDF test, but it may have failed, for instance, uh, in the mandatory uh, annotation properties for the ontology, in which case it is up for the ontology owner uh, to decide as to whether uh, this is a key thing or this is something that needs uh, to, um, to, to report to the person in charge of a standard so that the annotation properties can be expanded accordingly, or, I mean, the ontology owner uh, decides on the course of action. Um, for uh, quality assurance, we're using robot, but we're also um, using uh, some ad hoc methods that we have implemented over APIs. It's, it's also important to say that we are um, in the process of um, 
uh, having an API for robots so that we can uh, you make use of robot in a more uh, programmatic way. Um, <clears throat> what is the journey for a standards? How is it that we are going about defining these standards? So um, it, it's typical uh, work, it's typical software development process. We start by having requirements. Um, we go about uh, doing some research, um, what the standards are out there um, and how are they being checked, meaning what sort of quality methods are there for those standards at hand. Um, then if uh, the quality methods are there, um, um, then can we reuse that? Do we need to develop our own quality methods? Um, do we need to develop that in-house? <clears throat> and if we need to, then what is the specification so that it can be passed on to our developer? At the end, uh, our uh, standards, our methods uh, for uh, our quality methods have to talk to each other in a workflow way so that at the end I can, I can at any given point in time, run the workflow and have the corresponding uh, report over in our QA dashboard, which is basically a visual uh, quality verificator. Um, why do we need best practices and methodologies? This, this one is sort of easy to explain, but it's not, as, it's not so easy to actually go about and doing that best practices and methodologies because you have to consider how it is related to the principle, to the standard, and, and, and what uh, sort of what community are you talking to in, in this best practice and methodology. So um, it, it provides um, how-tos basically. Um, what are they? What are best practices and methodologies? So they, they basically provide how tools. They basically write templates that explain how explain how to perform specific tasks. <coughs> how can best practices and methodologies help us? Um, well, they basically um, help us in, in standardizing the process, and this is very very important. Um, let, let me give you an example of one of the best practices that we have put together, like for instance, the one that um, helped uh, our uh, communities to organize bow camps. Bow camps are like hackathons, but just uh, that they are geared uh, towards uh, gathering terminology, validating an existing terminology, or gathering, I don't know, gathering synonyms or gathering um, relationships across an existing terminology. I mean, depends on, on, on what you want. So we provide guidelines as to what should happen before the bow camp. What do you need to consider before running the bow camp? What do you need to consider when running the bow camp and how to go about running the bow camp? Uh, what actors should you involve, et cetera. And also we provide guidance uh, for um, what happens after the bow camp. What should you do once you have run this bow camp? What should you do? Um, this has proven to be very successful. I have to say that it surprised me, um, particularly because we were running bow camps uh, in the middle of the pandemic. So our bow camps are entirely virtual events. Uh, and having, as you can imagine, having the attention of people in, in these kind of events for an hour and a half or two hours, gathering terminologies um, is not easy, but it, it was possible. And I'm, I think that that's a, a pretty strong um, achievement of, of this project. Um, go more trainings. Why do you need trainings? Well, because you need to you need to break down the complexity. You need to you need to explain. You need to communicate uh, with uh, those who are at the end of the day going to be using, developing, maintaining whatever it is. Uh, those key assets, uh, terminological resources. So, GOMO trainings are a set of uh, a series of interactive uh, expert-led workshops. They are completely online workshops. Um, and, and, and again, these GOMO trainings also had to go, um, I mean, they also happened during the pandemic, so they are completely online. And at the beginning, I, I have to say that I was somehow, um, I, was, I was not very sure uh, whether uh, these kind of events were going to be a success because explaining these kind of things uh, and having to rely only on um, virtual tools was not something so easy, but, but it, was, it was also a success. Um, it, it, uh, all of our trainings are very practical, uh, so we are basically learning by doing, and they are very um, um, down to earth. So they're built upon our own business needs. How can they help us? Uh, they help us to teach people uh, how to go about the standards, how to understand the standards and best practices, how to do ontologies, how to maintain ontologies, how to uh, deploy, how to onboard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and what I have seen is that um, it's, it's also interesting because these training sessions have usually um, been um, very empowering for the communities. Once the communities start to understand that this is not rocket science, that this is something they can go about and, and try to do on their own, 
uh, they tend to request more training sessions. Uh, and and, and the, the complexity, the, the depthness of in the training sessions that they request increases over time. <clears throat> um, an example for a training session also rely, I mean, also, also derived from um, ball camps. It is, uh, for instance, for uh, how to run a successful a successful ball camp is a training session that we are um, that we are running now, um, where uh, we explain, I mean, from the perspective of who who is organizing the event, what should be considered before, what should be considered during the ball camp, what is the expected outcome, uh, what sort of pedagogic pedagogic um, tools should be used, like for instance, uh, when should you go about using PowerPoint, when should you stop using PowerPoint, when should you rely on other tools, like for instance, Microsoft Whiteboard, um, what, what should you, um, how to best organize the outcome of the ball camp so that you can pass it on to the ontology engineer and then the ontology engineer can continue the development process. What happens if you are not doing that, but instead you have an external contractor, how you go about engaging that external contractor into the organization of the bow camp and the internal community, et cetera, et cetera. So th those are all the issues that uh, we address when we run this, uh, how to run and, and organize a successful bow camp. Um, outreach, so last but not least, outreach is the um, branch in this project that has to do with um, community segmentation. Basically, uh, the, the, the main aim in outreach is not just uh, to empower communities, to identify communities of practice within, within BSF, but also, and this is very important, it is also meant to help internal communities of practice to establish relationships, to establish, to, to, to build bridges with external communities of practice. So a key area, a key business area in BSF is agriculture. And, and, and therefore, we need to establish strong relations with uh, communities of practice doing data standards or doing ontologies or terminological resources in agriculture. That's what we do in outreach. And, 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 and that's, that's, that has also proven to be very successful. It has also proven to be very empowering for the community because they have a sense that they are not alone. They have a sense that they can validate their approaches uh, with peers elsewhere, but peers nonetheless. Um, as a summary of what we have been doing, I mean, we have been working on GOMO for just one year. Uh, I mean, not even one year, it will be one year in September. Um, we have um, achieved quite a lot. So we have uh, some um, standardized training sessions like how to run a successful ball camp, bring your own data. Uh, we have guidelines uh, in the form of ontology tutorials, cookbook uh, for design patterns, uh, tool guidelines. Uh, we have also best practices, how to kick off an ontology um, development pro uh, project, uh, how to go about implementing the ontology, publication, maintenance. We have also um, built a series of, um, a series of um, ontology 101 um, events, uh, which are related to, uh, for instance, how to use WebPerdy. WebPerdy is the editor that we're using, the in-house editor that we're using, uh, how to consume ontologies over APIs, uh, and also uh, deep dives into ontologies and semantic web technologies. And these deep dives just help people to get, to get a, a sense of what uh, ontologies and terminological resources are, what, is a semantic web what are semantic web technologies, what are they meant uh, to support, uh, what do we mean by interoperability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> the, the governance in, in general, and this is just to close this, um, this session, is helping us uh, to have any given user um, applying the principles um, in the form of best practices, standards, uh, outreach, and training throughout the, all, the overall ontology development process. Whether you're talking about a development process that happens in-house or you're talking about a development process that happens with an external contractor, we have seen that uh, what we have, uh, what the, the content that we have um, built in, in GOMO is equally applicable. Uh, more importantly, and, and this comes from a recent experience um, where uh, new colleagues were joining the organization and they were being tasked with maintaining and developing some very specific ontologies. Um, we saw that um, these new colleagues uh, could understand the scope of their work, um, not just the scope of their work, but also how they were interacting with external contractors, et cetera, um, by looking at our best practices, by looking at our standards, et cetera, et cetera. 
And that was very encouraging because it, it, it'll help us to understand that we were really not just dealing with the ontology development process, but with the overall um, business of ontologies all the way through the publication and, 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 and doing these quality um, workflows that I described briefly. So um, I just wanna say thank you very much to uh, the team, the GOMO team, um, Jose Antonio uh, Diaz Bernabe, who is leading the, star the standards work stream, Prashant and Jose, who are leading, uh, Jose and Luis Sanchez, who are both leading uh, the uh, best practices and methodologies and Bonnie and uh, Carolyn McKay, who's leading the training part. I am leading the overall project and I'm also responsible for the outreach component. Um, as I said before, this project didn't happen in isolation. I mean, I was uh, very influenced by OVO, by bio um, schemas, and also about schema by schema.org. And, and that, this is not just about ontologies. I wanna emphasize this. This is now something that is related to uh, terminological resources in general. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for your presentation. So uh, we are now at our uh, Q&A session. Darani, I can see that you have a question. Excellent. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting to, uh, I, I, I was quite stuck with that, uh, with that first distinction that you made in terms of, oh, by the way, so I'm Darani, I, I'm, from, I'm from Yara. Uh, and we are all, I'm, I'm, I'm principal data scientist at Yara. Now, uh, I was quite, uh, I was quite interested in, you know, in the comment that you made in terms of the differences between the ontology and the business of ontology. And I would want you to uh, further explain a little more on how you look at these differences and how it has impacted your, uh, your methodologies internally in BHS. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's actually a very good question because that has been the scope of our recent meetings. Um, about a month ago, I started to wonder whether we were really dealing only with, with, with the development process. It was clear to me that uh, we were going further and uh, that we were uh, touching on data. Uh, it was also clear from discussions that uh, we wanted to stay away from, um, from data governance because that was a different topic and data management also because that was a different topic. But it was also clear that that, as, that, that ontologies were part of this data sphere. Um, and it was clear to me that we needed to um, focus on ontologies, but we couldn't lose sight of the overall data landscape. Um, it was also clear from, from, from many discussions that um, the business of ontologies uh, was, uh, I mean, it comprises the uh, ontology development process, yes, but it, it's more than just the ontology development process because um, the business of ontologies also has to do with the actual tools that support that, th those processes. Uh, and, 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 and that's a different ball game. I mean, when, when you have to uh, consider and account and be responsible for maintaining that infrastructure, maintaining an OLS, establishing a connection between the ontology editor, the OLS, uh, having an endpoint, an operational endpoint so that um, ontologies can be consumed by third parties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's a task on its own. That's a huge undertaking on its own. And that's, um, that's th at that point, from that point onwards, we have started our internal discussions have led us to understand that we were not just dealing with the development process. I mean, how you go about dealing with protege or how you go about understanding what is a class, what is an instance, when you have just a thesaurus, when you have, a, I don't know, a control vocabulary, when you just have a list of terms, when you have a full blown ontology, et cetera. Those are more, more uh, issues that are much more related to the actual development process of ontologies. But we were dealing with a lot of things that were not directly related with the development process, but were directly related with the business of ontologies. That's the distinction. I, I hope that, that it helps to understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's clear now. Yes, yes. Thank you, Darani, for, for your question. Um, Aaron, you have another question. Ah, perfect. Well, the first thing is, uh, congrats, this uh, presentation was uh, amazing, at least in the science, my point of view, Alexander. About the uh, quality assessment that you were talking about, uh, at least in the, in, the, in, the, in the picture that I saw, I saw that you have like a kind of pipeline following. So it's, I was 
wondering if it's all these uh, QAs is, uh, have dependencies of another one or not, or could have. Yes, um, <clears throat> you, you. I mean, they don't necessarily are dependent uh, one after in in, in, a, in a sequential manner. Um, but uh, we, our pipeline basically runs all the QA that we have and throws a, an, an output that is displayed over a dashboard. So, um, so those are mostly, I mean, when people talk about quality of ontologies, people tend to relate quality of ontologies with the content. So there are two aspects here around. One is the content of the ontology and the other is the, the, the quality that you can assess uh, in, in terms of syntax, in terms of uh, whether you have the right mm. uh, object properties, whether, mm. whether you have, uh, I don't know, um, domain and range for your uh, annotation properties. If you're talking just about a thesaurus, then that you have all the components of the thesaurus, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on the terminological resource, you have, um, you have um, quality assurance pipelines. With respect to the content, uh, you can go about testing the content by way of competency questions uh, using a Spark tool. Um, uh, we have seen, and this is something that comes recently, that uh, for people, uh, I mean, for people to understand, people who are not familiar with the Spark tool, if you give them a, a Jupyter notebook with the competency question, with the code, and with just a click execute, uh, they tend to lose the fear of the actual code. Uh, so, so that's something we have seen recently. Uh, and, and that's the kind of test that, that you, I mean, you don't do sequentially, the competency questions mm -hmm. is, a, is a separate test. And you also have uh, more, uh, I mean, more tests that we haven't yet started, uh, we haven't yet started to discuss in depth, which are tests that have to do with the actual content of the ontology. Uh, the domain being modeled. I'll leave it there, I think. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, this this question is more related with the uh, use of external ontologies. Uh, uh, should this uh, external ontology that we will use, so for example, in business, uh, have to pass also for the checking assessment of, uh, oh, of yes. the Gomo? Yes. 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 And yes. imagine imagine that they they don't work at all. For example, the, the building was not passing any check of, or some probably the, the some of them of the, the GOMO standard. What is your point here? Do you give, do you stop to work with that or do you modify it if you can, of course? I mean, about licenses. I mean, this, my experience, not just here this effort in general, it is that, for instance, uh, if you have a contractor who's building the ontology for you, very often what happens is that you don't know what the standards should be applied to what you're buying. Mm. So the contractor will go about building the ontology, focusing mostly on the domain, on the terminology that models the domain. But uh, standards like, for instance, what, how to represent a synonym, how to represent an acronym, et cetera, how to do uh, ex mappings to external ontologies, et cetera, et cetera, how to use same as, how to use see also, et cetera. Uh, that's not that's not something that you usually uh, give to a contractor, or at least in my experience, and and, and that was true here also in PSF. However, uh, this is something that that GOMO fixed, because now uh, when when we are onboarding ontologies from external contractors, beforehand the external contractor knows what standards should that ontology adhere to, so they know that there will be a test. And this is, look, this is an asset. Just like when you do lab work, uh, you buy regions, you, you, you buy regions of certain purity. And before doing your experiments, you usually test the purity, right? So you, you trust by veri but, but, but verify. And that's pretty much what we have here. So when, when you're onboarding ontologies from external contractors or for, from public sources, you always go through that, through, through that uh, onboarding QA pipeline, if you want to call it like that. Um, what happens if it doesn't if it doesn't pass that? I mean, if it is something that comes from the public sphere, it's really up to you. You you very often you have to fix it. Um, you can inform that back to the community, and this is why outreach is important because then um, the internal community knows how to interact with that external community, or uh, and, and depending on the response. Uh, then you can take the appropriate course of action. If it is an external contractor, it's kind of easier because you just have to say, look, uh, I mean, um, um, your ontology, uh, it, it, it comes in oval format, it, it complies with the oval format, but it cannot be transformed 
um, because blah, 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 right? This is a real example, by the way. Uh, so please fix it. Uh, and then your contractor will most likely fix it. Uh, so, so, so yes, I mean, this is something, I mean, those standards are, are you very useful, I would say. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, for your, your question. Um, so Dermot, you have a, two questions, in fact. Could you please tell us uh, your organization before asking you, your question? So my name is Dermot Doyle. I'm the CEO of Denaccurate. We have an AI which uh, automatically remaps ontologies. So my understanding, and this is the questions, uh, my understanding is that the remapping of the ontologies due to the evolution of terminology is one of the big barriers of one of the big costs in maintenance. So is this something which you're facing uh, in this particular sector and this, this project? And also what is, what's your strategy to get around that? Yeah, <clears throat> mapping, 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 particularly when you go, when you deploy the ontology over the single source of truth, um, how would you go about building mappings from that single source of truth um, to um, deprecated terms um, and deprecated terms that are not part of that, of that ontology, but are just um, links to other ontologies. Um, we, we are, I, I believe that, that we are not so mature or sort of standard in the way we're doing that. I have to say that uh, uh, there are too many issues <laughs> to deal with and, and that one, but that one is something that uh, will happen in the first quarter of next year. Mm. So first quarter of next year, uh, the plan that I have is that uh, the mapping issue has to be um, extensively studied uh, so that we can have standards, we can have best practices, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, methods uh, will come in play. Okay, great. Well, if we can contribute to that with our AI, just let us know. Just um, send me an email, I'm happy to talk. Thank you. So next, uh, Clément Jonquet. Hey, hi everyone. Very good and amazing work on, on, on governance that you try to, to, to in your project, to, to harmonize and uh, um, I'm very happy to see this. I was just wondering, maybe I missed the point or at the beginning of the talk or somehow, but why is uh, the BASF doing this? I mean, what is the motivation? Uh, do you see, is the company, as I said, co committed into playing a role into ontology governance for a specific community, the chemistry, or or you mentioned agriculture several times. I mean, what, what is the, the vision that, that, that your group has with such a project at BASF? Well, first of all, hi, Clement. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you around. Um, and second, just answering your question, every, every large organization, I think that every organization that has any kind of uh, data-driven strategy uh, has to go through ontologies. So uh, using ontologies is natural. We need to use ontologies so that we can produce our data, for instance. Uh, we need to use ontologies so that we can annotate our data. Uh, if we talk about knowledge graphs, uh, you, I mean, there is a part of knowledge graph development that goes through standardizing vocabularies. Uh, in our organization, we are not, and this is why at the beginning I didn't, I didn't uh, said, um, I, I did said that we're not talking just about ontologies in the pure sense of the word, but we're talking about more terminological resources because at any given point we have to deal with master data, reference data, business glossaries, um, list of values, um, plain flat terminologies, uh, full blown ontologies coming from uh, the public domain, etc. So, so those, and, and why are we doing this? Because we need, we need to, we need to, first of all, we need to control um, that, uh, that, that um, the duplication of work. <clears throat> we need to be sure that if we are using, uh, I don't know, uh, an ontology to describe uh, the, the species ontology, <laughs> then, then we use the same species ontology all across the organization. For that, you need governance. Um, because you need to organize the community around the species ontology. You need to be sure that you have a single source of truth uh, from where um, the internally people can consume the ontology programmatically or at the very least get that ontology so that they can ingest that in their, in their own applications. Uh, you also need to be sure that, um, that whatever additions to the species ontology you have uh, because of internal knowledge needs to be added happens in a very systematic way and in a way that it doesn't affect uh, all the different stakeholders. So those are just, uh, uh, I mean, they may be common issues for everybody. I suppose they are. And I have seen that they are common for many organizations, but those are the ones that, that we are dealing with here at the moment. Now, do we want to govern the ontologies in chemistry? No, I mean, we want to solve our problem. <laughs> But, but we have seen that we need to interact uh, with external communities um, in plants um, because we have an agro business. 
of course, in chemistry because because that's part of our business, um, but but in other areas as well. Not, not not sure if that answers your your question, comment. No, it does. Yeah, it, it does somehow. Yeah, you said that. So you experience the issues first internally, and so you think that you need governance internally. That's a good, a very good point, actually. <laughs> Probably the most important reason, and you're right to say that. And, and, and so I would be, I would be happy to see how all those, yeah, rules can be uh, rules, guidance, guidelines for for governance can be passed to 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 certain community that are not yet mature enough to set them up. I mean. CG has some good governance practices. Obo, uh, Obo has some others, and and, and some communities are really um, uh, interested in getting the, those inputs. So, yeah, I mean, bear in mind that that uh, I mean, when I my approach has been very influenced by by schema.org, by by Obo. I mean, the Obo principles, the Obo foundry principles, but also uh, by uh, personal experiences working with ontologies. One thing to say here, it is that um, my plan, I mean, for instance, the work that we are doing with the Stanford, uh, Clement, I think this, this is uh, very interesting for you. Um, the work we are doing with the Stanford with respect to the backend uh, for WebProtej and also with respect to the other work that we're doing with them is open source. So it is available at the, at the, at the, at the uh, wiki, at the um, Git uh, from, from, from WebProtej. I hope that uh, this uh, work that we are doing with respect to governance, namely the, the, the best practices, the, 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 um, the, the principles, the uh, standards are also going to be released to the open source. My hope is that that happens within the next six, two months or so. Um, now, I, um, one thing that I forgot to mention during my presentation is that uh, because we are working with WebProtege, um, we um, and, and because we, we we saw that there was no real manual or tutorial for web protege and that the pizza ontology tutorial was somehow outdated uh, and that could be improved uh, then we decided that we were going to be working out on, on, a, on a new version of this pizza ontology tutorial but changing the example from pizzas to uh, examples more from the bio domain like amino acids like chemicals etc um, and and geared towards web protege because we, I mean, we, we, for us, having um, having a, a web editor is key, uh, and and this is uh, this 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 new tutorial uh, is also part of the outcomes of this project, and I hope that that is going to also be released to the open source. Thank you, Alexander. Hervé, uh, you have uh, two questions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Hervé Ménager, I'm a research engineer at the Institut Pasteur. Uh, so I have two questions. The, the first is, uh, is, uh, is the material that you've been uh, presenting today uh, already uh, publicly available uh, somewhere? No, it will be, it is in the process of being um, vetted by the lawyers internally. Uh, and I hope that within the next two months, uh, we will make it available uh, over um, over a git uh, over a git space okay that's that's uh, that's amazing thanks a lot my my second question is uh, a lot more uh, specific and perhaps a, a bit technical uh, basically i was wondering uh, in in your process you you seem to have quite advanced uh, QA pipelines and processes for managing the evolution of ontologies. And you're, you're using both Git repositories and uh, web protege. So I don't have much experience with web protege, but one, uh, one thing that uh, keeps uh, constantly popping up is uh, is the lack of a of a deep integration between uh, web protege and uh, git repository for instance that's right yes. I, I was wondering if you had any process or any tooling that would take care of that um i know your pain i have also experienced the same issue Okay. We have discussed with this with, uh, with the WebRDJ people. Um, and all I can say at this point is that um, 
it will be much more clear by the uh, end by September when I mean come to the to the talk that the, the webinar in September uh, and then we will be <laughs> telling you some fairly good news with respect to that. Uh, but oh. definitely we will tell you uh, something that uh, could solve the problem um, in in that in that regard. Yes. Well, I'm I I will be there. <laughs> yes, I will definitely be there. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ervi. The question of Suno was uh, if you are maintaining this community live in terms of financial support. Uh, the, the community's internal community, it's, it's uh, internal BSF community. We will release the outcomes um, through the open source, or that's my hope, but we are in the process of, of, of looking into that. Okay, thank you. So next we have a question from Daniel. Hello, uh, hi. hi Alex, nice to see you, nice presentation. So I had um, a small question since, since you say that outreach is part of, of the principles and methodology, I was wondering whether uh, you have also preached these practices or apply these practices outside BAS and the user groups because, uh, well, there, there is other part of the community that is also looking into the fairness of ontologies and how to make semantic resources accessible, etc. Um, um, hi, Danny. Nice to see you. Um, look, no, um, we, as I said, this is this is an internal BSF project, and this is I mean, for us, it's uh, BSF is a pretty big company, so um, so we have more than enough uh, with the communities of practice here. Um, I suppose that once we are clear to release the outcomes to the open source, uh, then I would expect that, I mean, for instance, what I have seen is that uh, our work is very much in line with the OVO um, guidelines, the OVO um, principles. So I would, I would expect that uh, we can start the conversation with uh, OVO people so that uh, they can adopt uh, um, our work, uh, and by by way of that, of course, uh, it will reach uh, to a lot of more people. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Carlos, would you like to ask you a question? Well, I am uh, an old uh, IT person. I have thirty-five years in IT, and now uh, introducing myself to the. Uh, uh, digital twin world, okay? I am involved with the Open Ocean Data Alliance no? okay. to instrument the ocean and have information about the ocean. But uh, also I have been a lot of time with IT. I see that IT people concentrate much in the data sets definitions and integration of information, but there is no much uh, knowledge about ontologies and RDF, I believe in IT. Uh, what would you recommend to the IT community? Well, <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is something we have seen as well. And that's why part of our training uh, addresses issues around consuming ontologies programmatically, uh, when and where uh, to use ontologies in your product, in your digital product. Um, I have seen that uh, pure IT people are not well trained in knowledge technologies like RDF, like basic NLP, things like that. Um, I, think that uh, I think that the best way to convince people is to show the value that you can add by annotating, by semantically annotating data. Um, I believe that, um, that, that, that there is a little bit of a, of a generational gap there but there is also a lot of uh, lack of training, lack of appropriate training. Um, I would recommend that uh, training is key for that um, and, and engaging with that specific community is key also because um, at the end of the day, uh, you need to have the ontology being used by real products so that the value of uh, semantic data can, can, can be achieved. Otherwise, it, it doesn't work. I mean, you can develop the ontology, but you need to address the issue of the business value and you need to be sure that the ontology is properly used in the, in the, the product um, that is consuming the ontology. So yeah, so that's how we're doing it. But, but it's, a, it's an up the hill. It, I know from experience, it's, it's more an up the hill task because it requires a lot of uh, um, support. 
Then and also a lot of bidirectional communication, sorry, because for instance, you have the issue of master data that, that, that is related to semantic resources, to terminological resources somehow, but then you have to figure out how to best approach that in a way so that uh, the value in doing it is clear to everybody. I mean, it's, it's, it's an engagement process, I think. Thanks, Carlos. So Nicolas Matensoglu has a question. He cannot speak aloud, so I will ask uh, it for him. He's an independent consultant from Monarch Initiative. He's interested to know the, your perspective on resolving conflicts between ontology curators. We sometimes get situation where philosophical differences in ontology modeling, most famously BFO-based modeling or reality versus use case-oriented development, or polyhierarchies versus monohierarchy as a paradigm, cause such disagreements that they cause rift and overlapping ontologies being produced as a result. How can we overcome this in an in open ontology, especially in low resource environments? Look, um, first of all, we don't use BFO. And there is a reason why we don't use BFO. The reason is simply practical. Um, BFO introduces a lot, of, um, a lot of intangibles to the discussion um, when it comes to ontology. A lot of philosophy comes in um, and, and that makes the process, the, um, the, the, the domain expert engagement process, the knowledge elicitation process much more harder than it, than it necessarily is. So um, we uh, have um, not yet adhered to any upper level ontology. Um, somehow the standards that we are, that we are working on um, once applied, first of all, they are very easy for the domain experts to understand. And second, they are, they are, it is very easy for the domain experts that once you apply those standards, uh, you achieve that what they want, interoperability this network of ontologies. Um, this is not to say that, I, that, that, that we are not um, thinking about an upper level ontology. This is just to say that if we are using an upper level ontology, if we were using, or if we were to use an upper level ontology, my approach would be to um, hide the complexity of, of, of that discussion away from the domain experts. Because once you have that in the domain experts, um, then uh, your discussion is going to move from the reality of your data and your business needs into a lot of issues that are more of philosophy, et cetera, um, than, than, than really uh, on the data and the business need. So if we, I mean, we will probably go in that direction. I don't know if it's going to be BA. I don't know if it's going to be our own um, our own flavor of an upper level ontology. What I can tell you is that if right now where I am, the way I see this is that if we were to move in that direction, it would have to be a very simple upper level ontology, uh, one that um, facilitates achieving business goals. I don't know if that helps. That's as far as I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And Nicola is just saying also that there is a new task force at uh, Obo Foundry run by Melissa Endel that specifically deals with governance at uh, Obo. Just to note. Yeah, I actually, actually in the lead up for this project, I did have a meeting with Melissa uh, about governance. Okay. And so we'll end this Q&A session with a last question from Darani. Uh, thanks. Uh, me again, uh, Alexander. Um, uh, just, just, just digesting the discussions that uh, you've had until now. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I, ha I mean, maybe this is a bit more specific and if, uh, yeah, it would be nice to get your thoughts, thoughts on this, is that um, um, w what according to you are, are, or, you know, what according to you are the guidelines on rendering, you know, ontologies interoperable with ontologies from external stakeholders? So say, for example, you showed this slide where you had like the, entire uh, process that was, you know, I can't remember now, you had five steps and you had, was it the second slide where you had the, you know, the, the reactions, the, the enzymes and the acid at the end. Uh, I guess, you know, if you want that entire thing to be interoperable with something else outside, I'm sure that's the case with BASF. Uh, 
are there any uh, guidelines that you know or you know or processes that that you follow on you know what should be the touch points and how should they be designed and where can they be uh, designed into the ontology model well first uh, i mean the, the first uh, aim for, of our effort uh, addresses uh, issues within bsf um yeah, yeah. Second, um, if I if I were to consider that, uh, I would say that follow the standards. Second, uh, enforce some uh, design patterns in, in the development of ontologies. Um, and third, uh, promote um, an active uh, discussion uh, across uh, all of the stakeholders uh, having uh, having having a stake in, in any given ontology. I know this is hard because because you don't really know who are the stakeholders. You start with a community. This is our experience. You start with a community uh, that uh, pretends to say, these are the methods that I use. Uh, and you end up understanding that those methods are related to units of measurements, are related to, um, I don't know, a host, uh, a lot of different other issues. And then you end up having uh, to uh, segment and profile your community so that you can address those issues. So divide and conquer. Um, but bridge across communities is also key for that. Thanks again, Alexander. Yeah. Thank you, Derani. Well, so this was the last question of the Q&A. Thank you so much, Alexander, for proposing this webinar and for taking the time to prepare it. And also, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all the questions. Thank you uh, for everyone uh, that have logged in today. I will now hand it over to Elizabeth, the co-plate, to close this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Céline. Thank you, Alexander. And thanks to his team as well. Uh, they were connected uh, to share this uh, very interesting model. I think uh, we got uh, a, lot, uh, a large audience and many questions. So this is really something that is uh, needed by the community. And I think what would be nice is also to understand how our ontologies, community of practice can also contribute further than a webinar and a Q&A session. And that perhaps this is a follow-up uh, discussion with Alexander and uh, his team. Uh, I think it's very important. It demonstrates also that the collaboration between public and private partners is really necessary to, to, to develop uh, quality ontologies that can really help uh, reaching the desired fairness of the data in agriculture and agri-food systems. So that was great. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice continuation of your work and projects.